Donald Trump has been speaking out a little bit more about Israel's genocidal assault on Gaza, but mostly in the sense of like, I would have done it better. I'm not going to specify how. And you know, after October, it would 7th, be over by now. It would have been over by now. Like the the idea that he wouldn't have said, you know, bring fire and fury upon them after October seventh, if he were president right now. Of course he would have. And that would have been exactly what led to the same result here. Um, You know, the difference is just that, like, Biden is a Zionist and ideologically you read everything. I mean, he's emotional about Israel, like passionate about it. Um, And and he's an older man. And seemingly that's not moving. That's not shaken. Uh, The only thing that's working is pressure. The difference is that Trump is a maniac and also has a constituency of christian evangelicals who literally believe that when the jews go back to israel that the rapture or whatever is going to happen and a majority of jews will go to hell and burn in hellfire and some of the good ones will remain and then jesus will come back and that's like one of the more under discussed political realities of u.s support for israel is this right-wing christian evangelical base that backs the project wholeheartedly because of their you know visions of of religious uh utopia basically so this is trump now speaking on the tarmac um about jewish americans and he's repeating what he says often about how uh, Jewish people that vote Democrat are actually bad Jews, because he can determine that, apparently. Again, they brought down the rate so fast we just want to get elected. And it's going to work out just Have you called Netanyahu? Have you spoken to, have you spoken to Prime Minister Netanyahu? Obviously, the White House is issuing a stark warning. Do you think that the U.S. is not doing enough to show support for Israel? Or are you going to go? Biden has totally lost control situation. He has abandoned Israel. He's totally abandoned Israel. And frankly, you know, he's a low IQ individual. He has no idea where he is and who he's supporting. He doesn't know if he's supporting the Palestinians, but he knows one thing. He is not supporting Israel. He has abandoned Israel. And any Jewish person that votes for a Democrat or votes for Biden should have their head examined. What was can it, you like, say? Cheering, was it, like cheering at the end like he was the beatles walking off at like jfk or whatever <laughs> yeah can we get an encore can you say some great replacement theory stuff to fix finish the uh anti-semitism theme imagine if ilhan omar <laughs> <laughs> said jews that vote for republicans should have their head examined yeah <laughs> 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 yeah, well, we couldn't hear. Bradley said she'd get arrested off off my <laughs> anyway. Um, but yeah, uh, it's what can you even say? I mean, he's he's so dumb, and the I think it's interesting to kind of see how the making you know Israel Palestine into one of like a religious war is really all reactionaries and right-wingers can can fall back on um they can't analyze the power and elements they can't analyze the settler colonialism elements um they make it into like jews versus arabs christians versus jews and it's a thousand year battle yeah and it's obviously not it's biden is older than the state of israel so this is not to be fair he's a thousand years old (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, a um, lot of people have like Christian nationalist views for their own country as well. And so I'm mm. sure, you know, a lot of that is uh, aspiration, aspirational in the sense that, you know, a lot of those people, those evangelicals specifically, those people who want to frame it as their religious war, at least on the right, would like to pretend like America is some sort of eons old country that was a Christian nation put on a hill uh, by God and we're like living in the promised land too. So it's not surprising or also one where they could oppress and possibly genocide their uh, religious opponents. So it's not surprising, I think, 
think that they succumb to that framing because they agree with all the settlement or colonial like stuff. The part well, that it's why at- Nazis li- or anti-Semites and really far right people like Israel and, and they don't like it in the sense they'll still say horrible things about Jewish people, but they love the idea of a religious or ethnic eth- uh, you know, yeah. based nationalistic project. They like the idea that of a nation being defined by a religion or whiteness or ethnicity, what have you. So didn't mean to cut you off, Brandon. Oh, no, I mean, I just think a lot of this divide on the far right, in, as you were hinting towards, is just manufactured. Generally, they're racist. Generally, they're all in favor of these sort of ethno states. A lot of this division is because it's now more profitable, even amongst right wingers, to take an anti Israel stance, partially because of the rampant anti Semitism that's been fomenting on the right, so, you know, forever, but especially since Trump and, you know, online groper Nazis became way more popular. But uh, generally, I don't think it's an actual principled stance, uh, not even principled stance to protect Christians, because, you know, a lot of that stuff is just, especially from people like Candace Owens and Tucker Carlson, is just not real, it's like convenient. completely fabricated. It's, it's you know, convenient. It's like, it, the same with the IDW. Eventually, they get tired of, I think, uh, communing with each other, and they just manufacture a schism because it creates drama. It's just like wrestling. You know, it's just, every so often a tag team breaks up. And they have to start like competing for an intercontinental championship or something. And it's like, oh my gosh. Right. And it's like, there's always the one guy who makes it big and the other one fades into obscurity. And that's what we usually see with these guys, too. Look at Diamond and Silk, fresh and fit. Uh, All right. That's it. Um. (laughs) Those are the only two. Those are the only two I I could think of. I I don't think uh, there are any other partnerships. Yeah, the, I, it's the, it's kind of anathema to you know, right? They would it, it would look weak if another right wing personality were to have to have a partner. I mean, come on, it's got to be the force of your own commentary. Um, I mean, it's funny because like the Israel thing. I mean, in part, it's because of this anti semitism that like Brandon talks about, but also like what's going on is just indefensible. And that whole part of the um, right wing media sphere, of course, they exist to defend the indefensible all the time. But usually, you can pivot to. Aaron Rodgers or someone being uh, censored for uh, something like right to have to deal with it every day, day in and day out. It's like it's too much of a hit to a brand. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, that is, I think, more important to most people um, than Zionism. Let's take a call really quickly. Calling from an 818 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? It's Dave from Jamaica. Hey, crew, how are you guys doing? Dave, so good to hear from you. How are you doing? I'm um, not bad. So, right into the topic. Um, I wanted to talk about crime because I know a few be- weeks back, you know, people are trotting out the old 90s arguments. Oh, yeah. How to deal with crime at home. And, you know, very frustrating from certain folks. But the the thing I want to say is, though, I am I tend to since I've dealt with these type of arguments for a long time, especially in Jamaica, which we had, um, we still have crime issues, but less so now because there's more economic development. So I wonder, I wonder why. But so um, the issue I have is, I think sometimes in this debate we need to be a little more. I don't know what the right word is, but tougher with people in the sense that a lot of people can't repeat certain narratives about crime and so on and so forth. And challenging them tends to cause them to think about it, even though they might be upset in the moment, right? Because when you have to think about the position you're defending, you know, that kind of can crack open an avenue to change one's mind. Or am I alone in that type of thinking? Not you're you're right, not alone, Dave, but much I don't know if you're at work. Your phone's a little bit cutting out. Um, oh, yeah, and definitely mine. at work, so I'm going to make it quick. Okay. Um, so the last thing I, I want to add to that is um, how do you think we should, um, how do you guys think the best way to approach it? Because, like, you know, Sometimes reading out stats, people don't tend to listen. But, you know, I think it is a, you know, I think it's a, these things are kind of self-evident, you know, like, you know, if you have a job, you're not going to, you're less likely to commit crime. 
and people, you know, shoplifting or not making bank. That, I know that was a ridiculous statement in this. <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of people don't really understand how crime actually works, you know. There's no statistical no more people who are just who does like or kleptomaniacs. <laughs> so I do find it frustrating because, you know, I hear the same stuff and I I have it out with people and granted they're upset in the moment, but they 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 have to, they, they kinda of have to come to terms with reality and you know. It's not just bad people, good people, you know, a materialist analysis. Anyway. Right. Since I'm I mean, at work, the, I don't the, want the, Echo to kill you guys. So later. All no, right, you, cool. Well, what you're saying, David. Yeah. Yeah, basically, you know, the problem is like people. Uh, 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 this isn't an, uh, like a conversation about like an abstract policy or something. Like this is something that people actually experience in their everyday lives directly. Not like, oh, this policy does that, and that's effect- that affects this. This is a direct effect on people. Like if you're walking down the street and you know uh, something happens to you, you get attacked, you get mugged, whatever, you directly experience that. So if someone's telling you that, you know. Um, you know, the city's been, whatever city has been safer than ever. You're dealing with people who are like, well, I just had this happen to me. So how can you say that? Because that's basically how people experience these things uh, or how they view it through that lens. Like, you know, when we say the city's safe, it doesn't mean there is no crime. That just means statistically it's 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 you're less likely for something to happen it's less likely for something to happen to you it was worse unfortunately for for those people who it does happen to that they're they're they are that small percentage in that statistic but you know it's it's hard to convince them that because you know they directly experienced it Mm -hmm. but you know it's it, it's hard to like say like you said like people don't listen to like stats and stuff but this is something where like that is super important like no no one considers this until a crime happens to them like no one walks through their every day where crime doesn't happen to them and say oh everything's so safe crime isn't happening to me they ever only think about this when it does like the absence of crime is not something people think of they just that's just well, they, that's add- the default I'm, but it's it's sort you're you're right, Bender. But it's also people like get titillated by it. To be honest with you, that haven't experienced it before. So like it's driven a lot by specifically in New York, people that live in suburbia that are obsessed with property values that come into that that read the New York Post and women that listen to true crime or something like that. And they're almost just like, wow, well, you know, God, it's so scary. All these black and brown people in New York, and they'll read the New York Post or if people just keep their TV on. Every local news story is about some sort of crime, which completely misrepresents the trends, you know? So I think it's also right. like the prospect of it having to people, there's this, you know, I don't know. I, I, I It's hard for me. It's almost I, titillating is the only word I can think of, honestly. No, absolutely. Because yeah. because that's how that's how you have to cover it. Like, you know, the, the, the local news isn't going to be like, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say New York, 8 million people, uh, uh, 7.9999 million people did not have crime happen to them today. Uh, you know, they don't do that. They go, oh, here are the 10 people that, uh, you know, these are the 10 news stories where 10 different people had uh, something happened happened to them today and they rinse wash repeat and people see that and they go oh it must be scary out there or something when like mm. it's just you know that's just ridiculous to think about it that way like people's perception on this is completely like out of whack the fact that you're able to go to work walk down the street go to a restaurant go pick up your kids from school whatever and something not happen to you 9.9 times out of 10 is the fact that things are safe like their their crime yeah, is down. It's, it's also, I mean, I'm sorry. Were you going to jump in, Matt? No, no. I was just going to say. Oh. I was just going to say real quick. Prison populations, like you have to look at this stuff systemically. And, and the thing is, like, even into the individual lens of like this person says that like, points to like society needing to c- control people more is just not going to satisfy even victims of crime. Ultimately, you need to look at how these things, like, what leads to rising levels of desperation, that sort of thing. But also. You can't look at something like prison without looking at the fact that that means federal money for the um, to imprison people. That's an industry, and also that means you know uh, that counts to the census um, that the county that that prison population is in. So you take people out of certain communities and put them into like less uh, urban ones and count that towards like this is all systemic stuff. You just have to look at it that way. 
Yeah, I mean, just to, you know, echo what Matt and Emma was saying, I think you know, at local television level, you just see murder, 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 like kill, 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 uh, which I know probably sounds a good song, but it, it's, it's not. <laughs> it's just, it's, you know, it's just the eight o'clock news in New York City. At the, you know, more national news level, you might see statistics like Dave was hinting at about like falling crime, you know, overarching, like longitudinal studies about stuff. But I feel like even on, um, even on national news, you don't really see that contextualized. You know, you might see that crime has fallen since the 80s or since the 90s or since, you know, some arbitrary date and time. And they might gesture to like changing social social economic conditions in the country, but very rarely are they going to have someone who is just a criminologist or a sociologist come on and explain specifically what has caused the crime rate to fall, because generally speaking, America has a very conservative view on crime and that crime is caused by intellectual and moral failings of criminals and not the material conditions that we subject large portions of this country to, which make them desperate, which give rise to criminality in various parts of the traditionally deprived uh, communities. And so, you know, bringing people on to explain how crime actually works might be more compelling, but it doesn't fit that sort of larger narrative that crime is an individual, so individual uh, moral intellectual failure. So it, it's difficult to get people into thinking in that sort of more progressive frame of mind. Like Matt was saying that crime is a structural and social failure and we can it can only be dealt with that way because we just have a very individualistic society and people are, you know, oftentimes only hearing about like crime and what causes crime and criminals on the news from like cops. You'll have like a ex-cop or like an ex-DA come on to talk about like what he thinks is causing crime. And also to your point, Emma, like a lot of people's definition of crime is still like broken windows policing. And so they mm. see graffiti or they see a homeless person on the street or they see any other like long list of like urban trends like garbage and they immediately associate that with danger. And that was a concerted effort by the police and by uh, police uh, associated organizations to make it easier to over police communities. Yeah, Eric you know, Adams like, literally you know, that, that admitted last... that oh, in sorry. the interview with Oli Emmy. Uh, he's like, yeah, you know, sometimes people are concerned about it. It's like, bro, that's your job is to help people not see uh, the homeless problem as crime and actually something you need to address. You know, that's, that is a, I think that specifically the uh, issue of homelessness, I think that is a huge driver of this uh this fear mongering over crime that we're seeing right now mm -hmm. because without a doubt uh you know crime is down but also homelessness has gone up over the past few years mm. uh there is a distinct yeah. rise in homelessness now being homeless is not a crime and people who are homeless are no more likely to commit crime than anyone else in fact they are more often they're more likely to be the victim of violent crimes than be the ones to commit violent crimes but people see homeless people uh, you know uh, people housed people see homeless people and they feel unsafe so then they distinctly they they, they correlate that immediately with crime um and so that i really do think and then that's why we probably see this uh you know this this i'm seeing this everywhere mainstream media is going wild with this i heard on like the radio like one of the morning zoo shows the other day the whole squatting issue which yeah, has been a thing, thing forever squat first of all squatters there is no squatters rights law in new york there are uh tenant laws and a lot of times these uh people who are squatting claim to have tenants rights and that's why they're protected there's no like actual like um squatters rights in new yeah. york at least um there should be but uh um, to the extent they <laughs> exist anywhere it's because the alternative is brutality that people actually can't uh fathom even in like bygone years like that's why squatters laws exist in like e england or whatever it's because like the otherwise you, you just can't it, because we're so used to enforcing like bending society towards the capitalist needs now that we can't even fathom how these sorts of rights could have ever been enshrined for people that just need shelter. I mean, even the phrasing squatters versus tenants well, rights, but they're one right. and the same. It's just one is used to say, look at this delinquent over here. 
Well, I mean, you know, the, I, I, you know, I think, I think though, if someone, if someone owns a dilapidated a property that's dilapidated and have had no upkeep to it, and it's yes. harming the the neighborhood or the greater good of the people who live in the surrounding area, and you, it's it's like this for like a decade for some cases, like then, yeah, they, the city should take over, the, the local municipality should take over and say, we are taking this property from you. You are delinquent on it. You don't care for it. We do that with other things. Like you, you should yeah. not be able to, uh, oh, like someone who wants to live there and, and actually care for it should be able to take it over after a certain period of time. Yeah, I mean, just to your point, Matt, I think that the, the squatter thing is just a concerted moral panic to make uh, you know, the homeless uh, moral panic wasn't being inflamed enough. And so now the implication is that they're going to break into your home. Like you're going to go away on vacation and they're going to break into your home and they're going to squat in your home while you're out like in Turks and Caicos. And then when you come back, like, well, these squatter laws, they're not going to be able to get them out. They're going to have trash to place. And it's to make, you know, homeless people seem even more dangerous or to give this new edge to them that will make it easier for what I can only assume are like tenants association. I'm not tenants associations, uh, you know, uh, landlord, you know. Landlords, landlords essentially tenants yeah, landlords associations in places real like estate Florida, groups real yeah. estate groups to like kick you out of your home uh when you miss like one payment like because you're now suddenly a squatter 